In the last video, we used our knowledge of the natural numbers to set up the integers, and we're going to continue on in this video and use our knowledge of the integers to set up the rational numbers. As a quick review of what we did last time, what we did was we considered this Cartesian product, omega times omega, and we set up an appropriate equivalence relation upon omega times omega. And what this did was partition omega times omega. So we said that integers, what they really are, are equivalence classes. So this is why I say that integers are now members of the quotient space, omega times omega, modulo tilde. And graphically, what this looked like, we had the grid associated with the Cartesian product omega times omega. When we set up that equivalence relation, we are able to partition this grid into equivalence classes. For example, we said that, let's take the integer 3. It's the equivalence class of the ordered pair 3, 0, which happens to include the ordered pairs 3, 0, 4, 2, 4, 1, and 5, 2, and so on. So what we're going to do this time is very much in the same line of thinking. We're going to consider a Cartesian product, and we're going to set up an equivalence relation to partition that Cartesian product in. And we're going to continue on to use uh, these sorts of informal calculations, or essentially our intuitions about these, these numbers, to establish our definitions. Now first, let's uh, remind ourselves of what a rational number is. And of course, a rational number is written as a, a ratio of two integers. That's why it's called a rational number. It's written as a ratio, where we consider that number in a denominator as a, as a whole, and the numerator is expressing parts of a whole. So we have rational numbers like 1 over 2. But we also see that the representation of this number isn't unique. We can also write 1 over 2 as 2 over 4, or as 10 over 20. And this is very much similar to our representation of an integer with respect to a whole number. We could represent the number negative 2 as 2 minus 4, or 3 minus 5, and so on. So what we're going to do is very much in line with the integer construction. We're going to abstract this notation, a over b, as the order pair a, b. And as with the integers, since our representations aren't unique, we're going to have to capture all the representations of a over b in the form of an equivalence class. And of course, what that means is we're going to have to set up a definition for an equivalence relation. We're going to have to set up a criterion by which we're going to judge whether two rational numbers are really the same or equivalent. And what we're going to do is just use our informal calculation. So suppose we have two rational numbers, a over b, and we're saying that's equal to c over d. So what does that imply? So if those two are equal, then this implies that a times d is equal to b times c. And this is the key step in the formulation of our equivalence relation. At this stage, we can write out our definition in a formal manner. So first, I'm going to represent the set of all integers as the set z. And I'm going to consider a modified version of z. Let's call it z prime. And what this is going to be is just the set of integers, and we're going to subtract out the number 0, the uh, sorry, the integer 0 from that set. So this is going to be all the integers except 0. And in our definition, we're going to say that the number, the integers a and c are coming from the set z, and b and d are coming from z prime. So you can see here that a and c are going to be like our numerators, and b and d are going to be our denominators in our order pair. And we're going to say that two ordered pairs, a, b, is equivalent to c, d, if and only if a times d is equal to b times c. And this formulation makes sense because a, b, c, and d are all integers. And we've already defined what integer multiplication looks like. So now we're setting up the notion of equivalence of two rational numbers by appealing to the definition of uh, integer arithmetic. For example, we can see that from this definition that the order pair 1, 3 is going to be equivalent to 2, 6 because 1 times 6, we have 1 times 6 is equal to 3 times 2, or 2 times 3. And uh, you should verify for yourself that this relation that we've set up here is indeed an equivalence relation on z times z prime. That is, that it has the reflexive, symmetric, and transitive properties. And as with the integers, 
we're going to capture the equivalent order pair representations as equivalence classes. For example, we have the rational number 1, 2, 1 over 2. And we're going to say that that's equal to the equivalence class of the order pair 1, 2, modulo tilde. And to write out what the members of that set are going to look like, we have order pairs in that set like 1, 2. That's kind of the, the obvious representation of 1, 2, 1 over 2. But we also have 2, 4. And we also have the negations. We can negate both a numerator and denominator and still have the same uh, representation of 1 over 2. So we can have negative 1, negative 2, negative 2, negative 4, and so on. And as another example, if we have 1 third, some representatives would look like 1, 3. That's the obvious one. But we also have negative 1, negative 3, 2, 6, negative 2, 6, negative 2, negative 6, and so on. You should remember that equivalence relations are going to partition a set. In this case, we're going to say that tilde is going to partition the Cartesian product z times z prime. And as with the integers, uh, this sort of partition has a really nice visual interpretation. So what we have in this graph here, uh, instead of this z being on the horizontal axis, is now going to be on the vertical axis right here. We have all the integers. And on the horizontal axis, we have z prime. So we're going to have all the integers here, except zero. So there's not going to be any order pair on this vertical line here. And what we have mapped out here are all the equivalence classes of z times z prime. And you can see here, if we take the, let's take the rational number 1 half, you can see two order pairs. Actually, there's an infinite number, but we have two examples here. We have 1, 2, 2, 4, and so on. It will continue out indefinitely in both this direction and going that way too. So the representation of, uh, of the partition here is going to be these angled lines. And it's also interesting to note that the rational number is equal to the slope on this representation. So 2, the rational number 2 is going to have a slope of 2 on this grid. 4 is going to have a slope of 4, and so on. And you can see the negative rational numbers have negative slopes. And what's also interesting too about this representation is that it looks like all of these lines are meeting at the origin. But they can't because if they were to meet at the origin, they would all contain a 0, 0. And remember, we excluded 0 from that set C prime. So they actually don't meet in any place. So they're actually parallel in a sense, but they don't look like they're parallel. So, But the point is that they have a nice representation just as the integers did when we constructed those. When we constructed the integers, uh, what I tried to point out is that the, the fundamental statement that we had was that the set of integers, z, is equal to the Cartesian product omega times omega modulo tilde. So we can see z here is a quotient space. So this is the fundamental statement behind the construction of the integers, where this tilde here is an equivalence relation, which is going to be, we're going to say that two order pairs are equivalent, a, B is equivalent to C, D, if and only if A plus D is equal to B plus C. So that was the case that we had for the integer construction. And for the rational number construction, the fundamental statement here is that the set Q of rational numbers is equal to a quotient space as well. It's equal to Z times Z prime modulo tilde. Or tilde in this case is the equivalence relation. A, B is equivalent to C, D, if and only if A times D equals b times c. So you can see here that when we set up the rational numbers, we appeal to arithmetic on the integers. And when we set up the integers, we appeal to arithmetic on the natural numbers. So if you can understand these two statements here, here and here, you've really understood what's going on behind this construction. Let's now forge ahead and consider arithmetic on the rational numbers. So again, we're going to use our informal calculations to inform our definitions. So let's first consider addition of rational numbers. So we have two rational numbers, a over b, and we're going to add that to c over d. So what does this look like? Uh, you just find a common denominator, b times d, and then you adjust the numerators accordingly to meet that common denominator. So, so a over b plus c over d is going to equal to ad plus bc in the numerator, and then bd in the denominator. Just very intuitive. So this is going to give us the intuition behind our definition. So when we add two equivalence classes, or two rational numbers, 
suppose we pick AB as a representative of that rational number here, and then CD as a representative of this rational number here. So when we add the two, we're going to say that the new numerator is AD plus BC, and the new denominator, or the second component, is going to be BD. All right, and then as usual, everything makes sense here because we're dealing with integers. A, B, C, and D are integers, and we've already set up integer addition and multiplication. And as an example, let's see the calculation work out. We have one half here. This is going to represent one half, and this is going to represent one fourth here. So we already know what the answer is going, it's going to be. One half plus a fourth is three fourths. But just to see the calculation play out, we have one two, and then two eight. So A, D plus B, C. So we have a, D, so 8 plus 4, 2 times 2, that gets us to 12. And then B times D is 2 times 8, which is 16. And we can see that this equivalence class here, uh, the equivalence class of 12, 16, is indeed equal to the equivalence class of 3, 4. And there it is there, the equivalence class of 3, 4. And as always, we can show that the choice of the representative of a rational number was arbitrary. That is to say that. I didn't have to pick 1, 2 there. I could have picked negative 2, negative 4, and the calculation would have worked out. Or as a representative of 1 fourth, I could have picked um, 4, 16 as an example, and that wouldn't have affected the calculation. So having considered addition, let's move on to multiplication. And this is going to be just as intuitive. So if we have two rational numbers, a over b times c over d, that's of course equal to ac over bd. So now our definition in terms of equivalence classes is going to be AB, the equivalence class of AB times the equivalence class of CD is going to be the equivalence class of ACBD. So just as intuitive. And again, this makes sense because we've already defined up what it means to multiply two integers. And as an example, we have the equivalence class of 1, 2. So we're really multiplying 1 half times a fourth. And of course, we know it's going to be 1 eighth. So we have 1 times 2 that gets us 2 here. And then 2 times 8 that gets us 16 here. And indeed, that's equal to the equivalence class of 1, 8. And again, this choice of representative was arbitrary. I could have chosen 3, 6, or uh, 11, 22, uh, whatever you want. And what's nice about this is that the, the nice properties of integer arithmetic imply the nice properties of rational number arithmetic. So the rational number arithmetic is essentially inheriting all of the nice properties of integer arithmetic. One nice feature of doing arithmetic on the rational numbers is the existence of multiplicative inverses. And what do I mean by that? So if we consider the equation 2 times x equals 1, so we're searching for an x such that when I multiply by 2, I get to 1. So I'm essentially asking, what is the multiplicative inverse of 2? And if you consider the solution, this has no solution in the integers. There's no integer such that when I multiply by 2, I get 1. However, it does have a solution in the rational numbers, of course. We already know the solution is going to be 1 half. And more generally, I can say that any rational number except 0 is going to have a multiplicative inverse in the rational numbers. So if I consider the equivalence class of AB, so I'm going to represent some rational number as AB. And what I'm doing is I'm searching for another rational number, taking CD as its representative, such that I get to 1, 1. So again, we're going to assume a is not equal to 0, because we're, we accept that 0 is not going to have a multiplicative inverse. So we're searching for this representative CD. And just as we've set up a rational number of multiplication, we see that what CD has to be is we're going to have to let this first component be b and the second component be a, so that when I multiply a and b, I get a, b here, and then I multiply b and a here, I get b, a. And these two components are the same. So AB, BA is equivalent to 1, 1. So you can see that this is also very intuitive. When I want the multiplicative inverse of a rational number, I just flip numerator and denominator. So we're going to say that the multiplicative inverse of AB, the equivalence class of AB, is just the equivalence class of BA. And notationally, we're going to say that the equivalence class of AB, negative 1, or the inverse, is equal to the equivalence class of BA. So hopefully this is very intuitive. So we commonly write 2 times x equals 1. But now we know that 2 has a multiplicative inverse in the rational numbers. So what we can do is multiply both sides on the left by 2 inverse. 
So I get 2 inverse times 2 times x equals 2 inverse times 1. And of course, this simplifies to x is equal to the multiplicative inverse of 2, which we write as 1 half. And hopefully you can see that arithmetic in general on the rational numbers has very nice properties. And in the abstract algebra terminology, we say that the set of rational numbers forms a field when we equip it or we define up what it means to add and multiply rational numbers. And we also know that 0 and 1 in the field of the rationals are the additive and multiplicative identities. So 0 is the additive identity. So it's a number such that when you add it, it doesn't change the thing you start with. And then 1 is the number such that you multiply by it. doesn't change anything. So we have additive and multiplicative identities for addition and multiplication. And you should notice, too, that suppose we take the rationals and we just define addition or multiplication alone. These would form an abelian or commutative group. And remember, that just has the properties of closure, uh, commutativity, associativity, and uh, inverses. And identity, of course. And furthermore, Q is also dense in the sense that between any two rational numbers, one can find another rational number. And this is actually a very interesting property. Uh, the integers don't have this property. That is, uh, if you consider the integers 1 and 2, there's no integer between 1 and 2. It's just 1 and 2 at the ends. Whereas Q, I can pull any two rational numbers, and there's always one in between the two. And uh, I leave that to you to prove as an exercise. So I try to, try to keep these videos as short as possible. And my basic philosophy is that uh, I want to give you guys the, the basic concepts and ideas to allow you to explore the stuff on your own. And uh, here are the practice problems for this video. Again, uh, a bit more than usual. But I encourage you to explore some of these nice properties of, uh, of the rational numbers, especially if you're interested in things like abstract algebra. And uh, as always, if you enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and stay tuned for the next video where we construct the real numbers. Thanks for watching.